Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. I am Marilyn real alcoholic, and I am thrilled to be here. What a, an honor and privilege. Uh, I wouldn't be here without Michelle and MJ, who drove all the way to Cleveland from their home in Cleveland, um, and uh, we're wonderful company all the way to Akron, and uh, I, I thank the committee for uh, this wonderful, wonderful weekend like none other I've ever known. It's, it is really fabulous. And the speakers are, I think, the best communicators in Alcoholics Anonymous, bar one. But, um, uh, but uh, this is just uh, a wonderful commemorative of Dr. Bob and the beginning of our fellowship to which we owe our lives. Uh, there in the beginning, I've, I've loved to hear the story, to see the wonderful pictures that Lee, the, our great taper, has uh, put up. And uh, I was thinking about this experience of, of Bill in the hospital in connection with the steps this morning, 10 and 11. Sometimes people call those the maintenance steps. After we get through step 9, uh, then we can practice 10, 11, 12 forever. And they include the first nine steps, of course, because we continue to take inventory to clean up what needs to be cleaned up, seek through prayer and meditation to improve our conscious contact with God, and then the big step 12, which includes all the steps and working with others. And so uh, I'm going to talk about 10 and 11 this morning, uh, where we continue to take personal inventory, and when we're wrong, promptly admit it. And we seek through prayer and meditation to approve our conscious contact with God as we understand God. And we're asked to pray only for knowledge of his will for us and the power to carry that out. Uh, In the beginning, not Genesis, but in the beginning of Alcoholics Anonymous, Bill was in a very sad state, and he kept going to Towns Hospital, and he recovered enough to get out and drink again, and again and again, and back to the hospital. And when he reached such a desperate point, when he was in such despair, um, he called out to God, if you're there, show yourself to me. And lo and behold, he had some kind of mystical vision The whole room lighted up, and he was psychically transported to a mountaintop, and cool breezes blew through him and changed his life forever. Now, his grandfather had had such an experience on a real mountaintop, and he had been a hopeless drunk like Bill Wilson, and he had this huge conversion experience on a mountaintop and never drank again. And this was uh, an experience that Bill had, and it was some kind of religious experience, conversion experience, spiritual experience, but was it valid? And that's what he asked Dr. Silkworth. Do you think this was real? He described what happened to him. And his thought was, this is what the preachers are talking about, but what does it mean? Maybe I'm insane. Maybe I really have gone over the edge. And Dr. Silkworth had known him for some time and seen him walking down the halls with his beer bottles and... uh, uh, staggering around, and he said, no, I think you're a changed man. Something something happened. I think this is the real deal. Now, was it the real deal? How do we know that a religious conversion is the real thing? And we don't, of course. But people who have profound experiences like that often turn 180 degrees. Something miraculous happens in their lives and their lives are changed, and so we can tell by the fruits we will know them. Uh, And Bill never had a drink again after that experience. And he had been visiting the Oxford group 
occasionally, but he did not believe in God. He had abandoned that a long time ago. And his friend Ebby had talked to him about God and conversion, but he didn't really want any part of that. But after his experience, he thought, this is the answer. And, uh, and somehow he was moved within to talk with other alcoholics. He thought, this amazing thing has happened to me, so I have to give this to other people. And it just was not having such a big effect. And Dr. Silkworth himself said, maybe you better play down the religious part. Remember how, before your experience, you just could not, you weren't terribly receptive to that. So why don't you just talk about yourself and what happened to you, that you used to drink a lot and and now you don't drink anymore. And he began to um, think about that. So he was primed by the time on the Mother's Day weekend that he went to see Dr. Bob, that uh, he had, in his own mind, come to know that he needed Dr. Bob as much as Dr. Bob needed him. And so he said to Dr. Bob, I need you. I need to talk to you because I need to stay sober, and this is the way I stay sober. And Dr. Bob had not heard that before, and he listened and listened and listened, as Clancy said, for several hours. Four hours? Four hours. And uh, and Bill told his own story over and over again. And Dr. Bob was surprised. I'd never had anybody talk to me like that before. And that was the beginning of Alcoholics Anonymous, June 10th, Mother Day, Mother's Day weekend. And um, no, it wasn't. No, 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 I'm sorry. Um because Dr. Bob had to drink again. And then his last drink was June 10th in 1935. But that was the real beginning when he listened to Dr. Bill. Uh, and this is what happened to me. I was uh, an atheist. I'd studied science. And I knew that science could answer all the questions we ever have about the universe. And, uh, and it was elegant and it was beautiful. And that was my higher power. And I loved it. And yet there was something deep inside of me that was causing so much psychic pain, and I didn't know what it was. But the one thing that solved that problem that I had, the psychic pain that I just seemed to carry around all the time, was alcohol, of course. And so it became more and more of a friend. And at first it was fun, and then it was fun with problems, and then finally only problems, and I came first to Alcoholics Anonymous in 1969, but my sobriety date is February 8, 1972, so it took a while. It took a while for me to uh, to get the message. Uh, between my first visit and my third visit, I was treated for what I thought was a strange exotic malady, which the doctor said was chronic alcoholism. And I found that hard to believe. So I practiced my disease for a little while until one morning, February 8th, 1972, I was so, so desperate that I called for help. I called central office. So I'm a great believer in central office. And I'm glad that uh, we have a thriving central office in Los Angeles. And a 12-stepper paid a call on me uh, just as Bill had paid a 12-step call on Dr. Bob, and that made all the difference in the world because Lorena came to see me, and she talked about herself. She talked about drinking a lot and, and knowing that she wasn't an alcoholic, but simultaneously drinking ever so much. And I began to listen to her because nobody had talked to me like that before. I'd been to AA meetings, but I didn't hear that message because I sat in the back and uh, slept. And... Um, <laughs> But Lorena kept nudging me and uh, kept me awake and uh, took me to a meeting. And I was uh, able to hear the message that night, and the person speaking became my first sponsor, the wonderful Marion W. And she talked about fear. She talked about the things that I could identify with long before I knew the word identify And that is such an important part of recovery for me. And here I was in this fellowship, 
And people were talking about God, and I explained, I'm an atheist. I don't believe in God. Uh, and my sponsor and other people said, this is God as you understand God. It can be anything. It can be a radiator. It can be your car. It just has to be something outside of yourself and something powerful. It can be your sponsor. It can be your home group. And I said, but prayer, what about prayer? I just, I feel so hypocritical. And my sponsor said, give lip service to it. Just bow your head and say what everybody else is saying. And it doesn't matter that you don't think anything is listening. Uh, and that was, that was fine with me. I could, uh, could do that because I was taken into, as Harmon says, the famous Pacific group. And that's the kind of group that can occupy every waking moment. Um, and I just had the feeling that somebody was watching me all the time because it was true. <laughs> and, um, I had to check in with my sponsor the first thing on awakening, and uh, she uh, said, what are you going to do today? Make your list. And uh, the first five items on my list still took place while I was still in bed, like open eyes, try to sit up. And she would say, okay, now somewhere on that list, put get on your knees and ask God to keep you sober today. And she just began to feed me these little things to do that were not things I would normally do. Um, Early on, when I was about a year sober, a person came into the fellowship, Diana, and she became my friend. She's still my friend. And we've spent nearly 40 years together in sobriety. Uh, And uh, if you can get a best friend. If you can get a good friend in the fellowship, do it. Uh, That certainly has saved my bacon many, many times. Uh, Diana and I both came in as atheists, and this idea of practicing uh, through prayer and meditation was so mysterious to us, and we talked a lot about that and how we didn't believe in it. And uh, and yet we looked at the fellowship and we looked at people talking about God and giving credit to God, and we began to see that something was happening. Was it God? Was it the psychological effect of lots of people banded together for a common cause? What was it? We didn't know. But we had to admit that with all of our scoffing, this was working, and nothing else on, and nothing else on earth seemed to be working. This was it. And something that works, that's a convincing argument. And so there was some power here. Uh, plus the clientele. I mean, look at who we are. And yet we can come together and we take up our beds and walk. Now, how can that be given the raw material that we work with? I mean, you've heard the stories. Um, I spent most of my time in the garage contemplating life. Um, <laughs> So there was something, something here. And this is uh, God as we understand God. Uh, I did take the steps to the best of my ability. Uh, As I uh, wrote my inventory, I wrote my searching and fearless moral inventory of my Uh, (laughs) mother-in-law. And my sponsor even listened to it. And then she focused on this thing that she called Marilyn's part. And uh, that has become a thing that is a huge part of step number 10, my part. I have to accept that any time I feel bad, any time that my heart aches, any time that I'm in psychological trouble, there is something wrong with me. It's not them. It's not circumstances. It's something inside of me that somehow I have not accepted this, somehow I have not um, stepped up, up to the plate and taken my proper role, there is something in me that is not quite right. And that is the little indicator that uh, that something has to change through steps six and seven. I had to write two more inventories before I really got to Marilyn's part and the people that I had harmed. And those were my formal inventories of clearing up the past. And 
then it was on to step 10, which is inventory forever, inventory forever. And, uh, and at the same time, I was uh, giving lip service to this idea of prayer and meditation. Uh, and uh, uh, that was around my uh, third AA birthday. Something, something amazing happened. I was talking with Diana, and we seemed to be going on two different paths. She was opening her mind to this idea of something beyond human power. And she found that in uh, Buddhism, Zen Buddhism. And that has led her to this day. And I have seen the transformation in my friend through this, this path that she picked. She would go to sit in Zen meditation for 18 hours at a time and uh, heard something, and that was transformative for her. That was not my thing, not my calling. Uh, I, I knew that there was something transcendent, must be some kind of radiation through the universe. And my first encounter with God as I understand God was through waves coming through the universe, and it was the radio and um, and I began to hear the message. Uh, Roberta Flack was singing a song about killing me softly with his song. And by that time, I had begun to listen in Alcoholics Anonymous, and there was an old self inside of me that was being killed with his song. When I heard speakers talk, when I heard about uh, people who had lost their jobs because of their drinking, I... Uh, yep, that's what happened to me. I had a career in science, and it went down the drain with alcohol. I heard moms talk about uh, drinking while their kids were small. And I had three little children at home. And when I got sober, they were small, and they were wondering, where's mommy? And uh, that was stabbing my heart, killing me softly with this song. But then I heard happier songs, and I heard uh, Cat Stevens was singing, Morning Has Broken, like the first morning. And, uh, and I was beginning to see sunlight. And uh, I think it was Al Green. I can see clearly now. The rain has gone. And uh, that was uh, a message that, uh, that I heard, and that was as close to a higher power for me for a while. And it has continued to this day. My highest form of meditation is putting on my headphones with my iPod now. And there are songs that speak to me, songs that sing about God now. And uh, that is uh, that is a form of meditation that serves me well. Very different from my friend. But that's one one of the many things that I love about Alcoholics Anonymous. It is God as we understand God. And... uh, and around birthday number three, I had taken the steps. I had taken sincere inventories. I had made amends. And I just said, much like Bill Wilson, I didn't say his words, but my words, if you're there, I'd like to get to know you. And if you're really there, I'm willing to go on any path you pick for me. And unlike Bill Wilson, the room did not light up. It just stayed the same. Nothing there. But my heart beat fast because I thought to myself, I have signed a huge contract. Wow, I've given it all away. Now, many years later, I came to understand how ridiculous that thought was, that this prayer said I had already given it all away. In other words, I couldn't make such a prayer in my mind. I want to go on any path you pick for me unless the transformation had already occurred. In other words, I had been walked physically into the Fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous, into this big active group. I had taken the steps. I had done all of this. The transformation had already occurred. I had already given my will and my life over to this big thing that I was not quite understanding. Through the Fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous, the transformation had pretty much occurred. But I just acknowledged it in my mind. My mind is always the last to catch up, it seems. (laughs) But this is the language of the heart, and my heart, thank God, my heart was able to understand that. Uh, And and in the year that followed, I, I went through a lot of very deep emotions. I had 
put emotions, I had put feelings on hold for a long time, and it, it expressed itself as just crazy anxiety, paralyzing anxiety, what to do, what to do, obsessional thought. And in that year following that prayer, I began to experience deep emotion, and I, I had never, to my knowledge, experienced that kind of psychic pain. And my sponsor at the time, I had moved on from Marion because she moved away. I had a sponsor who realized that I was in such bad shape that she called her own sponsor Clancy and explained that he has this crazy, that she has this crazy, fairly new person and, uh, uh, she just doesn't know what to do. Um, and so I, I got a call in the midst of this, this time where I just felt I am dying from the, the, the kind of psychic pain I feel. And the phone was, hello, is this crazy Marilyn? <laughs> and I said, yes. And he said, this is crazy Clancy. And he talked, I don't remember the exact words, but it was somehow, you know, when we go through these, uh, Emotional bags, it feels like it could kill us sometimes. Uh, and then he used the word breakthrough. And that's the one word I remember from that conversation, that maybe, maybe it's something useful and good. Uh, other people, I had a few people on the program who had been through a similar thing, and they said that you will come in touch with your higher power through this. Just hang on. And that's when I really began to pray, hoping against hope that something was there. Hold on to me. Don't let go of me were my two prayers through this very difficult time. And one uh, Sunday morning, I just uh, knew I can't continue like this. I feel so terrible. And it had seemed to go on for a long time. And when I'm in that kind of a thing, I think it's always been this way, and it always will be this way. But I got on my knees, and I just screamed. I don't know whether I said it out loud or in my mind. I want out, and death, out of this kind of pain. And at that point, I had my own huge spiritual experience. And it was as surprising to me as it was to Bill W., and Bill Wilson, excuse me, we're in Akron. Yes, Bill Wilson. Uh, <laughs> and I was overwhelmed. It was just a thing that I hadn't imagined was there. Uh, I later told old timers about it, and they just smiled and nodded, having had a spiritual awakening as the result of these steps. But mine was of the sudden variety, so it was pretty much of a thrill. Um, and it, uh, it set the course of my life after that because I always had that to hold on to. I have touched the ephemeral. I have touched the infinite. And, uh, and it was as if God just put a fingerprint right on my brain. You see, I am there. I'm there for you. Don't worry. Uh, I, I, I was called into, um, just to give you a sample of how bizarre this was, um, I first asked, are you who I think you are? And it said, yes. And I asked a question. I said, now that I know you're there, should I read all the holy books about you? And there were great peals of laughter. <laughs> now, why I think that's authentic is that I, if I could have found God in a book, I would have, because I liked books. But uh, th th that's not not where it came into my consciousness, into my heart. Uh, and, uh, and so I held on to that. But, but I did read books after that because I like books. And a, an author that came into my life was Thomas Merton. Uh, there's a little meditation that uh, is handed around the fellowship. Uh, I have no idea where I'm going. I do not see the road ahead. It, it addresses God's will. And it says, what, do we, what is God's will? And the meditation says that we can probably never know that. Uh, and Thomas Merton was a monk who spent all the time in contemplation, and he didn't know God's will. But he said that, that if the desire to please God 
is uppermost in my mind, then I'll be led along the right path, even though I know nothing about it at the time. So that helped me with the third step, because I always wanted to know in advance, what is God's will? Just tell me, and I'll try to do it. But it is that if I want to please God, and if that's my ambition, that's my goal, then I'll be led along the right path. And I don't have to know in words what it is. Thomas Merton said another thing, too, and he was talking with monks in a monastery who loved to have visions and stuff. And, and um, I mean, that's, I'm sure, why they went to the monastery, because they really wanted to have that conscious contact, con- constant conscious contact. Try to say that. And, um, and he said that in the beginning, don't be fooled by lights and bells and whistles. That's just a little consolation. Sometimes when you're in really bad shape, God will give you a little light show. Um, (laughs) But don't get hung up on that. Uh, Real faith is going through darkness. Later, Mother Teresa, uh, her letters to her confessor were... um, were written in a book, and she felt bad about that. She had a great mystical experience that changed her life. She went to Calcutta that after that and uh, began to serve the poorest of the poor, the dying people, so they could die with dignity. And she was certainly touched by God. God's fingerprint was on her big time. Uh, her life was changed, certainly a real encounter with God and surrender to God. Uh, but she regretted that she never had bells and whistles. Uh, and, uh, and yet, uh, she was certainly faithful to the end. So I, I was, I was glad to read that because I had this, this thought too. Uh, when I came into contact with my higher power, I was actually an insufferable saint for about a year. And, um, <laughs> I began to tell people about this experience, and it was, I now, in looking back with great embarrassment, it was more holier than thou, like, I have been on the mountaintop, and let me lay it on you, and how awful that is, and and I've had that experience of other people doing that to me now, and so I, I know, I know what that is. And uh, and the funny thing is that I, I understood that there, there was a power here. And uh, in asking for help with whatever was in front of me, I was drawn back into life. Uh, I went back to school. I went to graduate school, and the children were growing up. I was doing my best to make amends to them. Our family seemed to be uh, united and happy, and uh, and life was good. And I was getting involved in the real world. I had a job that was fairly demanding, joined the Sierra Club, began to climb mountains with our young son, who was becoming a young man, and uh, we did many climbs together. Uh, Life was opening up, and I just realized that I was being led into life that I had seen from the inside of a cage, and I saw other people out there living life, and now I was living life. And... As I went out into life, I began to hear the call of get a better position, um, get some more money, just all of these things that you hear uh, when you live in the real world. These are the goals of many, many people, and they were starting to become my goals, and I wanted to be as good as they were in whatever area we were competing in. Uh, and I began to lose sight of seeking to do God's will, and seek to do God's will alone. I left my home group and did quieter AA. I was back at UCLA and uh, going to UCLA meeting. They were quiet. I still had a couple of friends, and Diana was a friend throughout. And I would run everything by her. And that, I'm sure, was one of my main contacts with the Fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I went to meetings. Thank God I continued to sponsor people. Uh, and yet I was taken up with the things of the world, and I had forgotten step ten. I'd go to bed every night grinding about something. The dean is just not treating us right kind of thing. Um, now, if you're involved in the university, you can grind every night. Um, there's a saying, why are academic politics so vicious? 
And the answer to that question is, because the stakes are so small. <laughs> and, uh, and I had forgotten, I had forgotten this basic principle, one of the basic principles of Alcoholics Anonymous, that when I am feeling bad and troubled and obsessed and thinking about problems, my problems, and I have to solve them, and they cause me pain, and they're causing me pain, and the institution is all wrong. When I have those thoughts, that's 10th step time. That is time for me to review the day and to know where I am hurting. What in me causes me to feel bad? Somebody else got the promotion and I didn't? Well, that's pride, that's envy. I could identify all kinds of character defects, but I wasn't doing that. I was just living out there in the world, still sponsoring people, still going to meetings, staying sober, but half measures because I was not honoring that that tenth step. Um, if you're old like I am, you probably remember refrigerators in the old days. And um, every now and then you'd have to open it up and get pans of water and turn the electricity off and defrost the freezing part. And... I'd like to build up the ice maybe two or three inches thick so it just looked real pretty in there. But then (laughs) you couldn't put in the frozen peas, so I'd have to defrost it. And so I've I've come to see the tenth step as kind of a de-icing process, the defrosting, because that icy buildup continues to accumulate just because I live in the world and I am subject to all of my character defects, and they begin to rise again when I get challenged by things of the world. Uh, it's also like cars. I, I was born in Ohio, and so I know ice and snow. I live in California now, so we don't get to see that. But uh, And then I lived in Chicago, where there's really ice and snow. And to drive a car, you'd have to go out and de-ice it. You'd have a little scrapers, and you click away at the ice and so that light will come through the window, sunlight of the spirit through the soul, to the soul, through this de-icing process. And, um, and I was neglecting that. But, uh, but then something happened, and I don't know what this is, but uh, uh, our youngest, uh, Susie, our daughter, uh, graduated from high school and planned a trip to Israel, and she lived on a kibbutz for half a year. And that was fun for her. And at the end of her... Her trip, she uh, uh, asked mom to come over. So I, I planned two weeks and went to Israel for two weeks. And now I had a tour guide because Susie had been there for half a year. And she spoke a little Hebrew and, and uh, knew the places to go to. And that was uh, a fun thing, to go there with a daughter that I adored and to have that experience with her. And we were standing on the Sea of Galilee, and I I took a picture of her, and I saw saw her standing there, and the wind was blowing through her hair, and the Sea of Galilee was behind her. And I I just know the historical significance of this country. When God wants to do something big, he often does it in Israel. And uh, three big religions came right out of that tiny country, and... uh, And I I was touched with that. And what happened to me was that I just thought, I want, as as Sandy Beach, wherever Sandy Beach is, oh, there, back in the corner, (laughs) uh, says the jackpot. I, I just knew that something was missing from my life. And what it, it was, well, it, it, my little son, David, a long time ago at, at, at Christmas time, when he was just not quite three years old, had been disappointed at Christmas time because he had gotten 25 presents and opened them all. And um, when he opened the last one, he burst into tears. And my mother was there, Grandma, and wondered, well, David, why are you crying? Why are you so sad? And he said, I didn't get just what I always wanted. And she said, what is that, David? And he said, I don't know. I just know I didn't get it. <laughs> and that, that was where I was that day in Israel. I'm here, and this is fantastic. 
And my life is in good order. We had our little family of five, and we all seemed to be getting along. And I had a good job, and I'd gone back to school and gotten the degrees I needed. And and what's missing? I didn't get just what I always wanted. But what is it? And I didn't know. I didn't know. But I had a longing for the jackpot. I, and because of Alcoholics Anonymous, because of this, I just, I knew it had to do with service. I knew it had to do with further commitment. And at first, since I had been reading Mother Teresa, uh, Calcutta, maybe I should go to Calcutta, but uh, people quickly said that's probably not your purpose. Um, <clears throat> But just look around you. Look where you are right now in Alcoholics Anonymous. And that's one thing about our fellowship. We can always step up our activity. There is always something to be done. Weekends like this to plan, uh, where a huge amount of work goes into it. My home group now, what I did, I went back to the Pacific group, my birthplace, the my childhood in Alcoholics Anonymous was spent there. And I had been telling my sponsees all along, uh, this is what we did in the beginning. I was in this big active group, and, and we were just all in different classes. I'm class of 72 because that's my year when I got sober. And, uh, and I realized I'm telling them that this is what I did. Why am I not doing it now? This is the AA that I love the AA that I thrived on. And so I went back to the Pacific Group when I was 18 years sober, and Clancy became my sponsor. And he sets an example that I can't even live up to in my mind. Uh, He is traveling all the time, carrying the message of Alcoholics Anonymous, uh, demonstrating that somehow if you have the fingerprint of God on your brain, you can do something way beyond human power. And I respect that, and I love to have that kind of example constantly in front of me. And uh, it has served me well. I went back into the group, and my goals, my ambitions became something entirely different. They became much, much simpler. I have, through, I think, just surrendering again to this kind of very active AA, uh, ended up sponsoring lots more women, and I can't hear my own defects so much. They seem like real problems that deserve serious thought. But when I hear them in others, I realize how ridiculous that is for you to grind down your energy on something that you can't solve. Uh, And and then I have to take a tenth step on being perturbed about the people I sponsor (laughs) uh, and release them to their own pain until they come around by sponsoring other people and hearing it in them. And, uh, and so we have a, a wonderful way of taking the, ste- uh, the tenth step, just listen to the people we sponsor, and then I think we can see our defects. Uh, and, uh, and as I said, my, my goal then became much more just wake up in the morning and see what the day presents and try to, uh, try to live in harmony with that, in harmony with the universe. Um, my friendship with Diana continued, and she continued to sit in Zen meditation, and I continued to ride my bicycle and listen to music and uh, and just say thank you, and I'm grateful. Um, it's funny, I just uh, uh, had a s- couple of strange thoughts uh, along the way that I'd go to meetings and I'd listen to people, and I just came to understand that my life was so blessed because I did not have the kinds of problems that other people have talked about. We've never uh, uh, suffered a huge financial disaster where we had to move out of our house. We've lived in the same house since 1963. That's kind of unusual. We are creatures of habit, but uh, uh, but we just have not experienced that. We had not had the kinds of losses that other people talked about. And I thought that uh, that I have fairly shallow faith because it's never really been tested like some people in Alcoholics Anonymous. And then I forgot about it because I thought you take what you get and sometimes success is harder to deal with than, uh, than the real scary things. Not that I had much success, but it was just... Uh, that I was not having real problems. And uh, 
So I, I last year in December, uh, went to State Line Convention, and uh, that was wonderful. And I was supposed to talk about steps two and three, which I did. So I talked on Friday night. And uh, in talking, I... I came to realize that I was really, really talking to myself. I talked about faith, about coming to believe. I talked about establishing that relationship with a higher power and then surrendering to it, surrendering my will to this higher power. And, and there had been some ups and downs. And I said that my faith had to uh, be shaken now and then. And then I had to come to believe in some more complex, more mysterious higher power that could explain things that I didn't understand. And each time that it was shaken, then it reestablished. And I used the phrase, I said that in extremis, I find that God meets me 90% of the way. And that's what I needed to hear. And after I left the podium, I noticed there were some frantic messages on my cell phone and uh, our son had married a year and a half before, and his young wife had called and said, we can't find David. And I began to call other members in the family. And I followed from Las Vegas what was going on in Los Angeles. Uh, they found that somehow David's car was in front of his workplace, and uh, the light was on in his office, and Aaron, his young wife, was throwing rocks against the window, and that attracted the police. And she told them, and uh, they finally found somebody that had a key and went in. And I was on the phone with Aaron and because we were all calling one another, and I said, Aaron, what is happening now? And she said, the police went in, went into his office. Oh, they're coming out now. And I heard the police officer say, I'm sorry, he's passed away. He's 42 years old. He's a mountain climber. He's an elite athlete. What does that mean? And I heard her screaming, and I, and she handed the phone to a co-worker, and I said, what is happening? What is happening? And, and nobody knew. The police wouldn't say anything. It turned out that he had taken his own life that night in his office. And... Um, I called my husband, who was there at home alone. Uh, and the first person on the program I talked to was Clancy. I called his room at midnight and woke him up. And he was a little bit gruff, and then he heard what had happened. And, uh, and because of my state of mind, I don't remember the words he said. But what I remember is that I got strength for the next thing, which was to drive home that night across the desert. And... Uh, and I kind of packed up and uh, got in the car. And about 1 o'clock in the morning, I started driving the seven hours to Los Angeles. And I had, I thought, okay, here I am. Here I am in this, this strange situation that I thought would never, ever happen to me. I'd heard about things like that, but I knew that was something that I could never survive. And yet here I was, driving home. And I had one CD to listen to in the car, an AACD. And it turned out that it was one that I had gotten at the Pacific Group. Sandy Beach had come to talk at our meeting. And he had lost his two daughters the year before to death. And I had seen this man come and talk, and I could see that he was okay. He was okay. But more important, he said at our meeting, he said, now if any of you find yourself in that kind of situation, I'm going to tell you precisely what I did. And he said that when you get news like that, you have some time to react. You have some time to react. And in that moment, you go out to God and you say, I'm not going to leave you. I'm not going to abandon you. And I don't want you to abandon me. And you reestablish that contract with God. Make that strong. And you just do that and say to God, I want you to be the most important thing in my life. 
And then Sandy said, and then when you begin to react, guess who comes back with you? So I played that 10 or 15 minutes over and over, and then I turned it off, and then I practiced it. And then I played it again, and I practiced it. And that was my company for several hours on that drive home. And then that was California by that time, and it was 3 or 4 o'clock in the morning, and I knew that my friend Diana was waking up in New York because that's Eastern time. And so I gave her a call, and she was there, and she answered the phone. And I told her what had happened, and it took her about a half an hour to get her mind around it because she knew David, our son. She knew him as a young man. She knew how he seemed to be a happy person successful by world standards, trying to get her mind around it. And once she understood, she said, now I'm just going to talk to you. And she talked to me for about four hours for the rest of the trip. We stayed on the phone. My cell phone somehow stayed charged. And uh, and we drove into Los Angeles. And we talked about the 40-year friendship of all the things we had done together. Uh, we even talked about pornography. Now, I don't know how that came up, but... Um, but she stayed with me and by the time that I got home the phone was ringing because this is we are sort of a super organism Uh, the word somehow was communicated to other people and people began to know and they began to call one of the first calls was from uh, Diana's sponsee Julie our outgoing secretary of the Pacific Group who lost her young son, 16 years old, to a car accident 10 years before. And I knew that she was fine. And there were these people that were saying, I've been there. Now look at me. The way is safe. Just do what's right in front of you. And I I was walked through that time. We had the grim week of of saying goodbye to David and uh, just uh, consoling one another. Five months have passed now since that time. And I can't think of a more wonderful way to spend Mother's Day than here at this weekend. It's such a blessing in so many ways. And already in this five months, I have seen that if I seek only to do God's will and just try to keep the ice off the window, if I simply do those things, that... As Polly often says, great events come to pass. Um, I witnessed the family that was left, the four of us, our two daughters and my husband, drew into a tight, tight bond and took in Erin, David's young widow, and now she's our third daughter. We've often thought of Erin as David's goodbye gift to us. She is loving and sweet and beautiful and a science teacher of all things. And uh, (laughs) and she misses David terribly. And Bill, my husband, was so proud of his son. David had become a scientist, and uh, he loved him so. But now he has taken in Erin, and she comes up every weekend. And she used to sit down with David and they would work out science projects for the kids. And now she comes up to our house, and my husband, Bill, who is a scientist, we're all scientists, um, <laughs> sits down with Erin and helps her with her science projects. And they have this sweet relationship. Her family is sort of scattered, and she now has a dad that uh, that fits that kind of special need for her to help with science projects and to say, we're all in this together. Thank you for being here. And that has given new meaning to Bill, where he is needed. He used to sit and talk about science with David. Now he can do that with Aaron. Our two daughters have produced all these little grandchildren, many of them, and uh, (laughs) five little boys, and finally a little girl came along. And... uh, And in that first month, we pretty much stayed together. We just moved from house to house, uh, taking care of one another. And I can see that that before, we were all kind of cold scientists. And we're not afraid now to do as we do in Alcoholics Anonymous, hug one another and say, I love you. 
Bill never said things like that to me, and now he says that all the time. I love you, little old honey. And and I say, and I love you too, big old sweetie. And and who would have thought? And uh, and another thing happened too. I was at my my home group, and a person that uh, is new on the program came up, and uh, she said, uh, I was in such despair, and I couldn't stop drinking, and I knew that AA just didn't work for me, and I knew the only way out was to jump out of my, uh, off my patio in a high building where she lived, and I knew I would go head first, and that would be the end. And she had written her will, and she had taken care of details. Uh, and she said that uh, she was going to do it that day. And she was at work, and somebody that I sponsor talked with her and told her the story of David and how it had broken the heart of his family and how sad we all were. And she had second thoughts, and she thought, you know, Some people would be disappointed. I'm not thinking of them. And she went home and tore up her note and uh, got sober in Alcoholics Anonymous. And she was reading Chapter 5 at our meeting not too long ago. And she's another person. She had that experience that turned her around, and she has been transformed. So I already see that, that good things are happening from this unthinkable event. Nothing that I would ever have wished for. I would have given my life a hundred times over for David. Of course I would. But I have learned, if these 40 years have taught me anything, it's, it's not to fight reality. It is to go peacefully and cooperate with it. And if I do that, great events do come to pass. Thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.